guess we can start. I, I make just one, I, I, perhaps I'm repeating, but I just do one uh, sentence of introduction. Uh, as usual, welcome to all of our participants, special welcome to our guests today. Um, you know, computer science between energy savings and waste. Yeah, I think this is, this is really the, the problem or the situation. Are we the problem maker or the solution provider? And I guess we will hear more from uh, Professor René Meyerhofer from the Johannes Kepler University of Linz. René, it's great that we have you here and it's your floor. Thanks a lot for organizing this ring lecture. I think it's really important to have those conversations. And I mean what I have here in the title that we have both solutions that can actually help, but we are also creating massive problems. And Today, in today's installment of this Ring Lecture, thanks everybody for joining for this uh, interest in that important topic. I would try to give a few examples, a few examples of what I mean with what solutions we can potentially provide and what problems we are causing as computer scientists. And the one thing that I would like to start with, because we are now all sitting together in exactly this sitting of a Zoom meeting of a lecture that is not in the traditional style. Let's talk about what has changed. And I think this has started happening before COVID, but COVID has greatly increased the speed with which we have seen some of that transformation, where many lectures, many meetings, many conferences, many sittings that previously were just face-to-face, -face, people coming together, traveling, uh, commuting into the same place and meeting in the same room for whatever lectures, for whatever meetings to either listen to somebody talking as we do it right now here, or to really interactively speak, interactively talk and work through problems, work through questions. And what we've seen increasingly since COVID is that we transform from, at least in some situations where it does make sense, where it actually works, where we transform from people sitting together, coming together in one room to something like this, where you maybe have your own office, you have a comfortable place where you can, in concentration, without being disturbed by people around you, watch whatever content you are currently trying to learn, where you can interact, where you can directly use your machine, um, in this case, in our cases, of course, computers, to work on problems immediately, interact through chat, interact through different means, whatever that video conferencing system gives you. There is obviously also the other way, and I'm very well aware that this is what we all do, that sometimes it's not such a well-organized way of listening into a conversation, participating in a meeting, or taking part of a lecture. Sometimes it's not a well-lit room where you can concentrate, but it's a dark side corner of an apartment that you share with others. And yes, I'm very well aware that we as co professors of computer science are not always the most exciting thing to watch. So there is obviously often some streaming going on besides. And if we are in direct competition between, um, let's say, a, an exciting video stream of people who actually know how to be entertainers and our lectures, we often lose in that game of who gets the most attention. So while we... As computer scientists, we can offer more flexibility. We can offer additional solutions to make it more flexible to have those meetings, to have conversations, to give lectures, to hold conferences. There are also issues that as a society, we might not really have tackled. And yes, how do we deal with the attention span? I don't know. I have watched myself in the last two or three years visit virtual conferences, so to speak, instead of traveling across the world to visit conferences and talk to other people in my field, I have tried the virtual experience and I never took as much away as I did with physically traveling because I was, I just wasn't as attentive. Even sitting in a room, listening to somebody with my laptop on my, um, with the laptop in front of me and reading email, I was still taking in more of the general conference, of the general talks, then I did just watching videos from my desk at the university because there was so much going on beside that one stream in one window and my attention just wasn't there. But let's assume that we are having an effective conversation right now that we can take this lecture. 
And I would like to ask the question of what does it actually take in the background to have this kind of video lecture? What does it take? What infrastructure do we need? And obviously, whenever we talk about not just video meetings, but anything that is together with ICT, information and communication technology, is we need communication. We need some form of getting bits and bytes across from one side to the other. That on the one hand, requires a communication medium, and on the other hand, requires some things sitting on the other end. If we have a complete peer-to-peer -peer video communication channel between two sides, then the other end is just the other person's device that we talk to. But very often, and that includes our Zoom video meetings that we hold here, there are servers sitting in the middle for signaling, for login, for also relaying traffic when direct communication between two parties is not possible. And in today's internet, IP version 4 with not enough IP addresses being available, it is often the case that two mobile clients cannot communicate directly with each other. So they have some relays that they go through. Now, for this communication, whatever communication we are talking about, there obviously it, that requires a medium. And it is quite possible that communication could using dedicated communication infrastructure. There could still be dedicated fiber lines between different universities in Austria to stream such content as we are having it right now directly from one university to another. But it's much more likely because it's more cost efficient to use publicly available infrastructure, maybe with some additional security measures on top. But it is public infrastructure we are talking about. And what is the public communication infrastructure that everybody has access to, it's the internet. There's only one internet, so we capitalize it. There is not multiple internets, there's multiple local networks, but there's only one internet connecting all those networks. And this is the cheapest, most economically, and also most power efficient way to communicate typically with each other. Of course, since all that communication does tend to converge into the internet, we do have what we call an attack surface. There can be unintentional mistakes, programming errors, somebody clicking the wrong button, somebody clicking on an executable in an email, or do, making an honest mistake, an honest mistake by authorized persons or some automated processes that can lead to safety issues. But maybe more relevant for the communication that we're talking about are intentional attacks that are done by unauthorized persons or processes and that intentionally do something wrong, that intentionally try to exploit a mistake, exploit an error, exploit a vulnerability in one of those programs. And this is a security concern, not a safety concern. By the way, coming from the German speaking background, we often have to try really, really hard to distinguish between those terms because the German word Sicherheit refers to both. Here, I'm when I talk about communication security, I really mean security against intentional attacks by unauthorized persons or processes. I will come back to this issue of security in our communication in one of the solutions that we can actually provide a little bit later in my presentation. But first, let's take a step back and let's talk about that communication medium that I introduced here in the middle, where we are really talking about the internet. And whenever we communicate, and that includes all the wired and wireless communication, then of course, that digital communication that we have, that at the end might actually come to our smartphone, that you might use mobile phone networks terminated at our mobile devices sitting in our pockets, that all such digital communication needs both cables and power. Cables, Infrastructure requires resources to actually lay that kind of cabling, that kind of infrastructure, and it requires power to keep it running. And that power can actually turn out to be significant. In the, in the following, I am not actually taking into consideration the energy and other efforts that have been spent into laying the cables, into laying the actual groundwork for the infrastructure that we use to communicate via the internet. The reason being is that I don't have any numbers. I couldn't find any good numbers of what the energy consumption, the other resource consumption was that was involved in actually laying those cables. And since we don't have any numbers, um, as scientists, I don't much like to talk about anything, but I don't really have specific figures. Now, 
why do I bring this up? Because we just should we we should just keep it in mind that laying infrastructure, laying communication infrastructure is also consuming resources. And we should reuse that communication infrastructure as much as possible to amortize that kind of cost. You lay infrastructure once, but once a cable has been laid, it can be used for decades. And uh, maybe, and hopefully if there's no damage, doesn't actually need any maintenance to keep that cable, ideally fiber cables just running. And that cable, uh, that cost that was used for laying it was bare, uh, you have, only have to bear once. But the power cost, the electricity power cost for keeping the infrastructure running, that is a constant power that you have to bear. So let's ask, how bad is that actually? How much energy do we need to keep the internet running, to transfer data as we have it right now here in this video lecture? I have tried to find, <laughs> excuse me, I have tried to find some figures, some numbers, some estimates really, to try to give you a picture of how much energy we are using by ha having this Zoom lecture today, and generally how much energy we are using for our data transfers. A lot of the figures that I found here are not really based on solid peer-reviewed scientific publications because there aren't many. And there are also not many official figures that you could get from the energy companies or from governments that would specifically tell you how much energy a specific, let's say, video call is using. So a lot of the figures that I'm presenting today are taken as an aggregate from different sources that I tried to find on the internet, of course. And I'm trying to give you links to those sources here at the bottom of those slides. If um, My slides will obviously be made available after the lecture and can be distributed through the web pages um, as we see fit. Now, let's start with estimating how much energy, how much electrical energy we are actually using specifically for the network transfer part of having such Zoom calls. And one of those estimates that I found that seems reasonable is based on the numbers that Zoom, the company itself, is um, publishing on their webpage. So the official figures of what the bandwidth consumption, the recommended bandwidth for having high quality Zoom calls or reasonable quality Zoom calls, every client should have. So those numbers are really taken from Zoom's numbers themselves and are per participant and estimating for a one hour video call using those figures. So it depends obviously on which quality of video stream you're using, the compression, et cetera, but those are average figures. So let's say from a uh, high quality to an HD 1080 uh, pixels video call, you every participant consumes somewhere between 500 megabytes and 1.6 gigabytes of traffic on average for a one-to-one -one video calling. This is per participant. So every participant occur, incurs this kind of data transfer. If we have a video call, then per participant is actually a little bit more because you have to send your own video, but you have to receive multiple video streams. Yes, on the Zoom server side, those can be scaled down, those can be aggregated. So the Zoom server side can actually do some uh, to help with the data consumption, but a video, a, a group video call will take, at least according to those estimates, will take more data transfer, more data volume than a one-to-one -one video call per participant. So here for group video calling in a one hour, uh, the, those estimates are between 800 megabytes to up to 2.5 gigabytes, depending on the quality setting of the video streams that you use. Now, if you sum that up, if you take that for a one hour video stream and multiply with the average um, estimated energy consumption for the network transfer, and those figures are actually taken from some older estimates that were published for the UK uh, data networks, they are probably pretty much representative for most European data networks, but those were specifically for some UK providers we get to um, about 0 0.07 to 0 0.2 something kilowatt hours for one hour of Zoom video call with six people in the call. Again, per participant here. 
Zoom can scale up to 1,000 participants in standard meetings or even further. And so for 1,000 participants, those estimates go to somewhere between 12 and let's say 37 kilowatt hours, again, for one hour of video lecture. That assumes that all participants send video. So all have video enabled. Obviously, the first saving that we can do when we have a large Zoom meeting that does not depend on interactivity, that doesn't depend on actually watching each other's reactions to Zoom, is turn off your video. This is counter to some of the social interactions that we would like to have. And I speak from personal experience. When we give video lectures, then it is sometimes a bit annoying to only see black squares. We don't know if people are still listening or if the, if the video stream on the next window is just more entertaining, or if we said something that loses people. In a physical lecture hall, in the faces of participants, you can see if they're still engaged. You can see if people get what you're saying or if you have to explain it differently. Just watching at black rectangles, you don't see that. But from a pure energy consumption point of view, it makes a lot of sense to turn off video while you're not actively sending anything uh, relevant through that video. You lose some information, but you save quite significant amounts of network transfer energy there if you if just one person sending versus uh, tens of people doing that. Now, let's assume, let's take some estimates for additional energy consumption that we could have there. If, for example, we don't take wired connections, but we take mobile phone, cell-based, cellular network-based connections to a mobile phone from your mobile network provider, then estimates go to a factor of seven to 10 above what we assume in terms of network transfer costs per gigabyte for the transfer itself. So again, we're not talking about the server side yet or about the client devices. We're still talking only about the network transfer. So for network transfer, it matters a lot what the medium is. Fiber or other cables are significantly more energy efficient than sending that through a mobile network over, let's say, kilometers of distance. Then the next factor is what energy, uh, what device are you using? Because the energy consumption of the client device is obviously massively different. If you use a big screen or a laptop or a phone, there's a massive difference in what you actually use on the client device in terms of energy. And finally, we need to talk about the servers. We need to talk about the relay servers, about the authentication, the signaling servers, all the cloud side that, that is still used to moderate those video streams that we are sending across. And this is the hardest part to estimate because this is amortized over millions of virtual servers and maybe a few thousands of these are used by to just relay Zoom calls. And this is really, really hard to estimate the energy cost. So, all that I said before, all those assumptions from the previous slide do not include any of the client side energy consumption and do not include any of the cloud server side consumption. And please remember, a cloud server uh, just doesn't magically exist somewhere. It's basically just somebody else's computer. It's somebody else's hardware that needs the energy to run and that also needed the original energy and other resource efforts to be built in the first place. So please reuse those for as long as you can because those first time building efforts, they will have to be amortized anyways. Cloud servers are probably a lot more energy efficient than the small servers that you might have sitting in your own closet, but still they bear some energy costs that is hard to estimate. So we don't have that included in the estimates so far. Summarizing, when I try to talk about what a Zoom call actually takes in terms of energy, we can assume that a video call with, let's say, five participants roughly for one hour in HD quality will consume roughly 0 0.1 kilowatt hours. Is that a lot? Um, 0 0.1 kilowatt hours, 100 watts for one hour. How much is that actually for the network transfer cost plus some of the clients uh, already being factored in there? It's comparable to about 0 0.2 kilometers driven with a combustion engine car or about one kilometer with a battery electric car. An efficient car at that and not at those outside temperatures as we have it right now, but um, warmer temperatures. So 
you can drive about one, one participant could drive about one kilometer in an efficient car to have roughly the same kind of energy consumption. And if it's a battery electric car, that's also electric energy consumption as a group video call with five participants for one hour. And that is the total consumption and not per participant, but the total consumption of all those participants for network transfer and for devices. Obviously, there's there are large error bars here. This is really just a, you could say, an order of magnitude estimate, but it's not accurate. It depends a lot on the device that is used. It depends on, do people turn off their video streams? So the estimate is that transfer efforts can be cut by about 90% by turning off video. If you only have an audio conversation instead of video, this is about 10 times as efficient as having video. So the standard phone call or using Zoom or any other of those methods just as, or um, any other of those products just for having an audio call is massively more efficient compared to turning on video all the time. Consider that if you need video or not, if you want to save energy. Now, of course, with devices, yeah, as mentioned already, with devices, it matters a lot what uh, size of screen you're using, what type of device you're using. I have some more figures slightly later in the talk on trying to estimate how much devices actually consume. But that said, one summary that I would like to take here for the first part of this talk is the old textual conversation, the old asynchronous email is massively more efficient than having a live synchronous audio or video conversation. Of course, that only holds if you don't also send a lot of additional data with that text communication. So if you have an instant messenger, if you use WhatsApp, Signal, whatever, and you constantly send large video memes or you constantly send audio messages instead of just sending text, then energy efficiency won't be that much better than having a live audio conversation. The message here, I think, is for digital communication, it can already save a lot of energy compared to people physically traveling to come together to the same place. So instead of all of us traveling to Vienna to sit in the same room, uh, we have already saved a lot of energy in having this through Zoom, having this as a virtual lecture here. We can save even more by using those tools that as computer scientists we can now provide by using those tools reasonably well. Choose what type of medium you actually need to communicate what you currently want to do. Sometimes text is enough and that's the most efficient way. Now, I would like to dive into a little bit of a sideline now before going into more estimates on energy consumption because when we talk through digital means, when we have any kind of conversation, textual or audio or full video live conversation as we're having it right now, then digital means also that others may have access to this kind of conversation. It is different to just two people sitting in a closed room and talking face to face. We have a clear expectation of who else can listen in or watch that conversation than we have in a digital means. So I would like to briefly take the sideline question of how much can we actually trust this kind of digital communication? If I'm presenting this as one solution that we can provide from the ICT point of view to help alleviate our energy consumption, then is this trustworthy? Can we do that? And I think one of the positive answers is now, as of the last couple of years ago, I think pretty much for the first time since we've had the internet going, we can assume that current mass messenger products do have proper end-to-end -end encryption. So we do have proper security measures for instant messages that really work and that work well enough that we do consider it from a cryptographic point of view. This is one of the things that I do research on, that from a cryptographic and network, um, network communication point of view, we do consider these to be secure. Truly end-to-end -end encrypted messengers do not give the provider of that tool the option to decrypt any of that content. So no, we do not assume that WhatsApp or Telegram, et cetera, if you set it up correctly, can actually um, 
read what you wrote there, can actually listen in to the audio messages that you sent or to the images or other files that you transmitted via those channels. There are a number of such messengers that do offer true end-to-end -end encryption. Now, of course, thinking about video conversations, audio conversations, live audio calls, not all of them are made equal and there are big differences. Zoom has claimed to offer end-to-end -end encryption since uh, I think three years ago. It turned out that the first end-to-end -end encryption implementations were yeah, a bit flaky. I would not trust them fully. And I'm not sure if I would really consider Zoom to be end-to-end -end encrypted at this point. From a cryptographic point of view, I have not seen enough proof to consider Zoom to be fully end-to-end -end encrypted so that Zoom itself could not tamper with the conversations. But Signal, for example, as one of the prime messengers right now that has been studied a lot also in academic circles is considered to be secure not only for text messages, but also for live audio communication and for some video calls, including some group video calls. That said, Signal doesn't have that kind of scalability. You can easily have a one-on-one -on -one video call with Signal with good performance with not a lot of energy for the transfer itself but it does not scale to the size of lectures that we have right now. The signal protocol isn't designed to do that. There are newer protocols that are currently being developed. And this is again, a contribution that computer science can make to make it securely possible to have those kinds of large group conversations. Why do I classify them slightly differently? Because on the one hand, law enforcement or other parties, the provider itself can no longer decrypt the content itself or perform mass scanning, but most of those messengers still leak what we call metadata. Metadata in the sense of who communicates with whom, when, how often, how much, which types of media, which groups you belong to, etc. All that kind of metadata is still leaking, even if you have fully end-to-end -end encrypted communication. And this is not even a given because there's still currently a, a pretty heated legal debate between the EU Council, Commission and Parliament, which is termed jet control by some. I'm not going into details. There are a lot of details available if you're interested in that. But the jet control debate comes down to basically does the client software, does the signal WhatsApp or the Zoom client have to include machine learning models to on the client device itself scan for whatever is considered to be unwanted content because end-to-end -end encryption actually works. So the good news is if the encryption part is implemented correctly, then there is no way for the provider or other law enforcement parties to actually get the content. They have to be scanned at the client side before it is encrypted or after it is being decrypted. And that debate really is either banning end-to-end -end encryption completely again, and I think that ship has sailed. I'm, I don't believe this is going to happen. So the real debate is do we... Um, need or want to have mandatory scanning modules, black box machine learning models built into our secure client to do this kind of scanning. And turns out most people don't think that's a good idea. Also from a scientific point of view, we have also in Austria, Austrian academia, we have participated in multiple open letters in that debate and made clear that we have strong security concerns if that should ever come to pass. Now, also within that security of communication sideline, a small note, because this comes up again and again, what, what does it change if we have our digital ID on smartphones? Is that also a tool that can save energy if we don't have to print our passports, our driving licenses, if we don't have to print those paper and plastic documents, but we can have all of that on the phone? I can't give you numbers. I just don't know if that is more energy efficient, how that compares. The only thing that I could say is that it's probably going to happen. So Android started in 2020 to include support for mobile driving license and other what's called identity credentials on phones. iOS is doing similar things. So it's going to happen. In Austria, we have the ID Austria with e app. You can get your mobile driving license on the phone. Does that help save energy? Because we no longer have to, uh, have to produce the physical documents. I don't have good numbers. From a privacy point of view, it can be positive, it can be negative, it depends a lot on the details. What all those 
services that I currently uh, that I talked about so far, the video conferencing, the instant messaging, but also those digital IDs, what all depend upon is, however, a form of digital identity. So again, we need to talk about this further sideline, what is digital identity, to even make a sense of can we securely communicate in a digital way. And digital identity, when we want to use it not only for, let's say, video conferencing, for social networks, but also for, for example, as driving licenses or for opening our doors, for our travel tickets, for maybe a future mobile phone version or just in the cloud version of having your Klima ticket and being able to use public transport with that, it can be a saving factor that we can offer. What does it mean? It means that we need to have some sensors like biometric sensors, for example, cameras that take on the events when people enter public transport. We need to have some verifiers that open the doors or that just account for people doing their public transport. And we need to have individuals here in the physical world interacting with the sensors and verifiers to just go through their daily life and hopefully do that saving energy in the meantime. And on the digital world side, how can what can we offer from a computer science perspective to make this efficient, to make it not only energy efficient, but to also make it nicely usable, to let people easily use such kind of system? The easiest thing is, of course, a central database where all the sensors, all the cameras, all the fingerprints, readers, et cetera, all feed into the central database. And the verifiers know which one to query and then can open doors after verifying that, yes, this person identified by this face actually has a valid public transport ticket. They actually work at this place. They can travel. What else they would like to do with the credentials that they hold? Now, I'm from a security and privacy point of view, I don't believe this is the way we should go simply because it's just such a massive attack surface. Coming back to this, everything converges into the internet. What does it mean for the security? It's an attack surface. And if you read uh, names of companies on that list, all of those have lost account data that they had in a central place. You see all the big names there, Facebook multiple times there, you see Microsoft on there, you see Adhar here on the bottom left corner, which is the database of biometric credentials that is used in India with billions of accounts in there. And all of those have lost certain parts of their account database. So I think having that centrally, while more energy efficient, to be honest, it would be more energy efficient to have one central database of the whole population, the whole global world population in one place, because then you can actually optimize for the database. You can optimize to make this as efficient as possible is from a security or privacy point of view, not the right idea. So one thing that in research we talk about is having this decentralized giving people the choice of where to host their identity that could be on the mobile phone that they carry anyways, that could also be with a cloud service provider of their own choice, or maybe at a small microcomputer, a small Raspberry Pi that people might have running at home. And then having the debate about what is energy efficient and what is not is a different one because it's no longer coupled to the security and privacy risks that we have. Now to and the security sideline, I just want to point everybody towards that supply chain security that we also create as an additional problem in computer science. Because computer science systems, that very much includes Zoom, that very much includes all those services that we currently use. They are very complex systems of systems. They use libraries, they use services. Those services are coupled together, however tightly that may be. They are connected via network services, maybe local services to think about a specific energy usage case. If in, a, in an apartment complex, you've got multiple charging stations for electric cars, then they need to coordinate so they don't overload the local grid connection, the local power grid connection when all cars do fast charging at the same time. So they coordinate. There are open network protocols like OCPP there, or you might need some remote services, just maybe a simple thing like a time service for synchronizing your different internet service components. And they are all dependencies that any such services like Zoom and like others need. Those supply chains, they are interdisciplinary. They are technical in the sense of any error in one of those libraries and any one of those services that another service uses 
can lead to a failure of the whole system of systems. They are organizational. You need to have contracts in place. They are economical. If you tie yourself to one specific service provider, even if it might be more energy efficient to have one big data center and just one provider taking care of all the virtual machines that we use, you have an economical uh, dependency on that one service provider. They can unilaterally change their license and service contracts and just make it more expensive once you're tied into their service. Or legal, regulatory um, considerations as well. You can have illegal dependency of one country making a service to another country just illegal for the time being or um, as putting some additional regulation on that. So just be aware that whenever we talk about gaining energy efficiency through any such digital services, we also create typically much larger, much more complex chains of dependencies that we may or may not be aware of. They also have energy requirements, those chains, those additional dependencies, they also need to keep running. But in addition to their energy requirements, they might make a service just not available in the future. And if we, the, the more we depend on digital services, even if it can save a lot of energy, the more brittle all of those systems will be. Now, ending that sideline of talking about security and safety of such communication, I would like to come back to some more numbers. And since I already opened with, I might not be the most exciting thing that you have today in your browser windows, you might have another stream open. Let's ask the question of how much energy does it actually take to watch a video stream from one of the um, video streaming providers. And I've taken Netflix here, not because I want to advertise for that service, but simply because that is one that has been looked at during COVID and afterwards. And different people have come up with different kinds of estimates. And one thing that already is visible is depending on who does the estimate, it can vary wildly. Again, looking only at the network transfer part of it, not yet looking at the server side or the client side, just the network transfer. There are estimates between 0.9 kilowatt hours per gigabyte of transfer to 0.1 to 0.2 kilowatt hours per gigabyte. On the video stream, on the Zoom video streaming example, the Zoom uh, video conferencing example, uh, sorry, that I used before, I used the lower estimate here. But for the Netflix estimates, there have been different kinds of estimates that people have published. So this is roughly how you can see where the error bars are by seeing different kinds of numbers and comparing them. Here, I would say the order of magnitude is probably right. What the exact number is, I really cannot tell. But one thing is pretty much certain, if you transfer wirelessly, so if you watch a Netflix stream, not through your local net, local wired internet connection, but if you watch it through a mobile network connection, through a 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever connection, then there is definitely more um, effort, more energy effort for this kind of mobile network transfer than there is for, uh, for a wire transfer. It is hard to really estimate per gigabyte because mobile phones in particular do a lot of energy saving tricks. It is much more energy efficient to use the maximum bandwidth that you have with, an, with a mobile phone network, use all those 100 megabits per second that you might be getting if you are in a good location and stream the next 15 minutes of that video stream immediately to your phone, buffer it, and then basically send the radio to standby and save energy than it is to constantly transfer little chunks of that video stream. So if you're not having a live synchronous video streaming that as we have it right now, if you don't interact, but if you have a prepared video stream that you just wanna watch, then through batching and other mechanisms, there can be massive energy savings, which also means that it's harder to estimate. It doesn't make a lot of sense actually to calculate per gigabyte of transfer or per kilobyte of transfer, whatever, but it is more reasonable to do that averaging per time because then you have the radio has to be online for so much of that time for this kind of video stream, like for an hour of video stream, you know that you have to transfer this much and then you can average over how long that radio has to be on. And so one estimate that has seemingly makes sense is that for one hour of streamed video, 
the transfer costs are about 0.08 kilowatt hours. Now again, is that a lot? Let's compare that to the viewing devices. If you watch that on a TV, then a TV can, in the sizes that we typically have in our homes right now, can take anything between 50 to 200 watts, typically between 100 and 150 watts. So it's it's adding another 0 0.1, 0 0.15 kilowatt hours for each hour of watching that. If you do that on a desktop computer, well, then it, it depends a lot on what type of desktop computer, what type of computer screen you have for the desktop computer. It can go down to 50 watts or even below if it's a very efficient desktop computer or if it's a gaming rig, 500 watts and far beyond that, depending on a GPU that you're running or the big screens, the pixels that you're driving. Laptops, again, there's a large range of how much energy a laptop will take. If it's running in a reasonably power efficient mode on battery, then it will probably be around or be sometimes even below five watts. For video streaming through a wired connection or a good Wi-Fi connection locally, you can get away with around five watts for watching a video stream on an energy efficient laptop. But again, if that is a big laptop with a big screen with a GPU inside optimized for high performance gaming, it can go well beyond 150 watts as well. The most efficient, obviously, also because of screen size. Screen size matters a lot for a viewing device when it comes to estimating energy is the smartphone. A smartphone running on battery with a local good quality Wi-Fi connection is somewhere in between 0 0.23 watts up to 5 watts while doing heavy gaming with the GPU being on at full tilt. Although that said, 5 watts will probably not be sustainable for a long time because the smartphone will just heat up too much and the CPU and GPU will have to throttle to get rid of that heat. So 5 watts is often considered to be rather the maximum power consumption that is sustainable over a reasonable amount of time, but not much more or not much longer than that. Now that considered, you have to add that to the network transfer. And of course, if you don't watch video, if you stream music instead of video, then there is a significant saving in data transfer. And specifically, if you also stream video with the screen off, then you do not bear the costs of driving the screen and driving the pixels maybe with a GPU. That can significantly, uh, that can have significantly lower energy costs for music streaming than video streaming. But if you stream music, and if you stream music in a way that does not aggressively cache on the local device, but where you actually really stream and only have like a 10, 10 second, maybe 15 second buffer, because the service does live streaming, then you have to keep the radio on. And if that radio is not a Wi-Fi connection, but is a mobile network radio, then you consume a lot of power just for the radio transmission. For music streaming, the radio transmission is much more significant compared to the overall energy consumption than for video streaming. Bear that in mind, please, when you listen to music, if that's live streamed, then you incur a lot of network transfer costs just for live streaming. It is much better to have locally cached music or video files on your phone and consume them from the phone multiple times, ideally for the cached version. Now, let's put that in perspective with the Zoom call that we have before. So the video streaming is roughly comparable to a Zoom call. If you've got a Zoom video call with five participants or the estimate of one hour Netflix network streaming, then the network transfer costs are roughly comparable. They are in the order of magnitude of 0 0.1 kilowatt hours for one hour each. The device costs already mentioned depend a lot on what you watch it on. And for smartphone viewing, so if you, if you watch a video stream, Netflix stream on a smartphone, then you can estimate about 80% of the energy used for watching that stream actually goes into the network transfer. For a TV, it's obviously very different. For a TV, it's probably mostly the device cost. But for a smartphone, it really is a lot more efficient to cache those uh, things that you watch, those videos that you want to watch, if you have good Wi-Fi access, for example, over a wired connection, than to stream them directly over a network connection. Now, for devices, one thing that I would like to add here is that 30% estimated for TVs and 
80% estimated for smartphones of energy consumption actually go into the production of the device over the lifetime. So it doesn't actually matter all that much if you spend a lot of viewing time on the phone for the energy that the client device itself consumes while you use it after you've bought it. After you've bought the device, only 20%. You can be more energy efficient. You can save by using the device a little bit less, by turning off the screen, by using uh, a smaller resolution, etc. 80% you have already incurred by buying the device. So the most important saving for smaller client devices is using them as long as they work, using them for as long as possible, because that will save the most... Uh, in terms of energy over the lifetime of that one device. Now, let's come back a little bit to the data centers, which I haven't considered so far. And it's really hard to attribute any type of energy consumption to the cloud services themselves, to the data centers themselves. We have some estimates around 200 terawatt hours per year for all the major data centers that power a lot of those internet services, that power Netflix, that power Google, that power Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Plus about 250 terawatt hours for the internet, so to speak, for the network bandwidth that we consume. And those together are, are roughly about 2% of the global energy consumption that we have on the planet. So it is significant. What we cause as a discipline, what we cause as computer science services is significant in terms of the energy consumption. By the way, 2 to 3% of the global energy consumption is roughly what the whole of aviation does. So we are causing energy consumption that is roughly in the order of magnitude as the whole of commercial um, aviation, as the whole all the planes flying around. There's one more thing to keep in mind when we talk about video streaming, audio streaming, music streaming services. Again, is vendor lock-in. Of course, if you don't buy any media, if you don't buy any CDs, Blu-rays, whatever, then you're locked into having bought it with that provider. It's just something to be aware of. It's not something that is really negative from an energy consumption point of view, but it's something to keep in mind. Now, I would like to end the last part of my lecture today with the question of, what about payment? Now we've talked about uh, we've talked a lot about video streaming. We've talked a little bit about the security of digital communication, but a lot of what we also do in our daily lives has to be paid for payment. So what is the answer that we currently have from a computer science point of view for payments? And what does it mean for the energy consumption? Of course, we're talking about cryptocurrencies here because that's the new hype thing or has been in the last 10 years. Trying to digitally pay without having to resort to what proponents call fiat money, without having to resort to all the old money systems run by government and central banks, which also consume some energy and quite a lot of resources to ship all that around and to keep running. So how do those cryptocurrencies and blockchain is one of the underlying technologies that are used to build cryptocurrencies, how do they fare when we talk about energy consumption? And here there are some numbers that have been estimated by the University of Cambridge. And here we see that in 2022, uh, the only the Bitcoin blockchain itself. And here I'm not talking about the other blockchain type cryptocurrencies that are around Ethereum and um, Mobile Cash and Zcash, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not talking about those, but just the main Bitcoin blockchain that consumed in 2022 about uh, 200 terawatt hours per year which is significant. And then we saw quite a crash in energy consumption between 2022 and 2023. That happened because in 2022, a lot of that Bitcoin mining, a lot of that hashing that actually uh, causes all that energy consumption happened in China. And there was so much energy consumed in China that it caused brownouts in the Chinese electricity network. And so the Chinese government actually started forbidding Bitcoin mining in China and Bitcoin miners had to leave China. A lot of them went to Kazakhstan and they Again, in the electricity grid in Kazakhstan, they were thrown out of Kazakhstan. And now a lot of that is going on in Texas. So maybe here at that peak time, when we had about 200 terawatt hours a year, 
that had about 75% of Bitcoin mining happening in China. Um, just to keep in mind, because if anybody controls 51% of the mining power, of the hashing power of a blockchain, they basically control how that blockchain can develop and they control the spending transactions that go in there. At the moment, I think it's spread a little bit more, but we are here roughly at about uh, 75, 200 terawatt hours per, um, uh, per year at the moment. How much is that? Can we put that in perspective? So the, at the peak, when it was about 200 terawatt hours, that compares roughly to the energy consumption of countries the size of Thailand or Vietnam and is not far away from what Australia as a whole continent consumes in terms of electricity. Now, after mining power went down because China kicked miners out of the country with the 75-ish terawatt hours, what you can see here is that it compares fairly closely to the whole energy consumption of Austria. Everything that we need with, uh, sorry, electricity consumption in Austria, everything that we need in terms of electricity in Austria right now, all the lighting, all the heating that is not fossil based, all the uh, industrial production that uses less electricity than the Bitcoin network, which at the moment we cannot really use as a currency because the transaction fees and the transaction delays are so bad that you cannot buy any small things. Uh, you can pay up to a hundred US dollars for a transaction fee for a Bitcoin transaction right now if you want to have it verified in reasonable time frame. So Bitcoin is used as a speculation object and it is used for paying ransomware at the moment. Those are the main use cases for or Bitcoin, but it's not really a currency as it was promised to be. Now, of course, there's always the argument that this kind of Bitcoin mining lends itself to use renewable energy. So it drives the installation of renewable energy because it is actually a good deal for the crypto coin miners to use renewable energy. So look, let's look at the numbers. Unfortunately, I haven't found anything newer than 21. But here, as you can see, the energy mix being used by Bitcoin mining up to that point with uh, the link here where the estimates come from are not favorable. The renewables are actually fairly low here. There's some nuclear energy and there's a lot of fossil energy, including a lot of coil that was being, that was being used just for driving the Bitcoin mining, just for solving unnecessary crypto puzzles, unnecessary hashes for the cryptocurrencies. Um, so that argument doesn't stand up to a look at the numbers that it would actually drive the installation of more renewable energy. Now, there's one other thing that has been floating around. It has waned a little bit. It's no longer as much of a hype, but the non-fungible tokens, buying stuff through just cryptocurrencies that you could use in gaming or that you could use in other like arts comparisons, whatever. That was just always a pretty big scam, to be honest, but you never, because you never bought the digital medium itself. The only thing that you bought with NFTs was a link in one centrally held database of that one NFT provider that you were actually linked to that one data item, to that media item, for example, to this kind of whatever item in the game or to this kind of uh, picture. You never owned the picture when you bought an NFT of a picture. You only owned the link in one database that your name was attached to that picture. And people spent a lot of money for that. And that actually drove more of the Bitcoin mining. We seem to have gone beyond that hype, luckily. But there are, of course, other blockchain cryptocurrency types that do not require what we call the proof of work. That solving of cryptographic puzzles like hashes just to prove that you're probably honest because you spend so much energy and uh, because you spend so much energy, you probably have good things in mind, right? Yes, there is proof of stake. There is proof of um, size, proof of storage. Basically, there are other, <coughs> sorry, other kind of proofs that you can use instead of proof of work. They just have different assumptions. But what does not change for most of those blockchain-based uh, storages, they're really just data structures, is that they're irreversible. So you need to end 
address a few questions of, do you really want all transactions to be irreversible, that you can't undo it if there is any mistake happening? And that has the side question of, do your programmers never make any mistakes? Is there really no errors? Is there no vulnerability? Is, is that contract 100% correct? Because code is law. The contract is whatever is written in the code. And if somebody finds a way to outsmart that code, to work around its rules or to use its rules for their own benefit, then you cannot reverse that. Do you really want to publish all details publicly? Because this is what a public ledger based on blockchain does. All transactions are published and you can look it up. Yes, you might not have a name attached to a cryptographic address that is really the wallet address of somebody owning those kinds of assets. But if you ever find out who transfers from those crypto assets to fiat money to real money or vice versa, you have a link and then you have all the history of what happened before with those transactions. Do you really want every node that participates in this network to mirror the whole history? And that goes into the hundreds of gigabytes for, block, for the Bitcoin blockchain right now. Are there really no trusted third parties? Is there really nobody else that you can trust to help you? Are there no banks? Are there no governments that have some trustworthy role that they could fulfill in helping you do those transactions? And how many of those transactions do you actually need per second? Do you need more than about 10 to 100 transactions per second? Because right now, those currencies, those cryptocurrencies, they do not scale very well. And finally, if we talk specifically about proof of stake, do we really want to trust people who just have more money, more with the voting power over the rules that govern that blockchain? Because this is what proof of stake means. Whoever puts more money onto that one scheme can control more of the voting that happens for uh, regulating the transactions. There are many more detailed publications to try and answer in which cases you actually could benefit from blockchain as a data structure. And it turns out most of the time there are much more efficient methods to gain the same or sometimes even better security guarantees than what people try to get with a blockchain. Yes, there are some legitimate and real use cases for having a blockchain-based data structure with distributed systems with full mirroring of the content, but there might not be as many as, uh, as you would think. And most of the time, you really just don't need it. So putting it everything together, you've already seen these numbers, just repeating that slide. How does a blockchain-based cryptocurrency figure in there? Well, a single Bitcoin currency can take up to 2,000 kilowatt hours, a single transaction. If you compare that to one hour of Netflix streaming, that's a factor of more than 2,000 in between. Like you can stream over 2,000 hours of Netflix at the moment for a single Bitcoin transaction. It's even if it didn't have those high transaction fees, just the energy consumption of what we do by proof of work is completely unsustainable for paying for small things. And those 100 to 200 terabyte hours, they compare energy consumption of all the major data centers that we have globally. So what kind of utility do we get out of Amazon, Google, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera? What do we get out of that compared to what we get out of the Bitcoin blockchain? And I think there's a massive difference in utility for an energy consumption that is on par roughly with the services. So just from this point of view, do not do proof of work. It is not efficient. It is not reasonable to spend this time, uh, this amount of energy for the services that we get from this. Finally, how good are any of those numbers that I gave you today? And the short answer is they're not good at all because we don't know how accurate they are. I can't even tell you how big the error bars are. For example, for the network transfer consumption, the estimates, um, Kilowatt hours per gigabytes is not a good unit to extrapolate because it significantly depends on just keeping the whole system running. Just keeping those fiber lines powered takes most of the energy anyway, anyways. And then it doesn't really matter how many bits you transfer over them because you need to keep the base system running. So dividing the overall consumption by transferred bytes makes reasonably only sense for attribution, for after the fact figuring out how much of the energy cost we should attribute to which of the services. But it's not good for extrapolating how much it will take if I now do a new video streaming, if I now do a new lecture. 
data center usage is very hard to measure because it's very often based on completely indirect data. For example, companies reporting how much it costs to run a specific site, a specific data center, and then dividing by how much energy that translates to, and then dividing by roughly how many virtual machines they have running there. So it, it is a wild guesstimate there, and it's definitely not comprehensive across data centers in the world, but this is also extrapolated from few data points. It's also changing very rapidly, specifically with machine learning models, with the large language models, we see lots of additionally massively increased GPU power usage to power that kind of machine learning. And as I tried to explain for client devices, it depends on so many factors, on how often the radio wakes up, how often you transfer different batches of uh, network uh, data, how much you go into standby or energy saving modes, how often you charge the device, because every charging cycle will incur some inefficiencies. The improved efficiencies that we also see in client devices, and we've seen lots of improved efficiencies, are unfortunately also often counteracted with increased usage. We have much more video and audio streaming and video conferencing now than we had five years ago. So while our devices became more efficient and energy transfer became more efficient, we also use them so much more. And all of those factors, all of those uncertainties add up and I don't know how good the numbers are, the estimates are that I quoted you today. I just hope that they give at least an order of magnitude, that you can get a little bit of an insight into what it actually means for ICT services, what we can use them for to save energy, but what also we are causing in terms of additional energy usage. With that, I'm at the end and I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. Really, this is, you know, I'm saying the same what I have said all the time for all the lectures. We don't read to, we ha don't have to read crime stories. It's enough to listen to these lectures. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank so you. I, thanks, God, that I'm using my mobile for listening to your <laughs> lecture. I had to use it since I was uh, commuting from the main building to my office, but hopefully I have uh, used less energy. Although I, you know, I always feel a bit bad when I, like today, it, you have given such an energetic um, presentation and it was such so tempting and you are only looking in black tiles. So I feel a bit embarrassed or bad about it, but yeah. <laughs> This is, this is the cost of sustainability. Yeah. No, I, I mean, uh, again, thanks for organizing it that way. I think that is the right thing to do. And having ring lectures with all the Austrian universities participating is a really good idea because it gives a much broader picture than anyone could give. So thanks for organizing it that way. I am totally happy to do it that way because energy-wise, it is the right thing to do. Even if I can't see faces, if I can't see people nodding, I hope that it was um, sufficiently interesting for people to still be engaged, even if we can't have this kind of interactivity. But we can benefit from that. Yeah. Uh, there is some, there are some questions in the chat. Do you see that chat? I see that, yes. So thanks uh, for reporting the average energy usage of one particular system. This, These are excellent data points. They fall quite in the middle of what I quoted, I think, here. And yes, it is, it is significant energy consumption that, of course, is a lot less than physically traveling there, but it is something to consider. Now, there is a question, are desktop pictures more energy efficient than the typical video pictures uh, via cameras? Uh, that's a hard one. So is that referring to just having a background that is not live stream, but a background that is um, put behind the face, behind the speaker? I'm not quite sure what the question is. If you if you want to, please feel free to speak up and uh, explain in more detail. Um, what I'm trying to say is um, something about uh, the desktop pictures. If, if I have a Windows picture on the screen, instead of um, I use my camera to show my face. And the, the question was, is there, is there any possibilities to have um, these des desktop pictures that are more energy efficient than the um, communication via the cameras? 
so I, this I would say depends on how specifically the transfer is done. If it's not done stupidly, but if there is reasonable compression in those video streaming systems, then yes, any static picture would be massively more energy efficient because any codec worth its while would only transfer a static picture that doesn't change only once. It would, it would not keep on transferring the static picture. That said, if you have a small picture of a speaker just nodding occasionally that is in front of a mostly static background, then a good codec, client-side codec, would should also uh, code that down to only the differences between the different images. It's really hard to give good numbers. You would have to average over multiple times to actually figure that out. But yeah, I mean, a static picture is definitely more efficient than a live video stream. Then there's an X question. Yeah, there's Zoom a question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Are, are there was also a question to me. Excuse me, Rene. Uh, yeah. Just to, to our students. Uh, I know I'm um, owning you the information in too well. And um, believe it or not, I will provide this information before Christmas. Yeah. So then you know what to do in January and February. And uh, I don't want to waste time now. Okay, Rene. There is a question about um, aren't Zoom meetings and all other streaming platforms not ideal for showing slides? Wouldn't uh, it be wiser to create a platform where a signal changes the page? Yeah, I agree. So I think there is a lot more that can be done because the slides would not necessarily have to be shown as a video stream. If they're just static slides and you switch from one slide to another, then having a, let's say, a presentation that is really a web page and that synchronizes the slide changes for all the viewers by just sending very small signals to now please display the next bullet item would of course be a lot more energy efficient. Um, I'm just not sure if it would be practical for um, just other considerations. Many people, and me included, do their slides very last minute. And if you have to distribute, it, distribute them in advance and make sure that you have a format that every client understands particularly, then uh, people would have to be better prepared. And we tend not to be. I'm very much including myself in that um, last minute things. And the other thing is that you would force speakers to basically share the source of their slides instead of just the final output. And not everybody, not all kinds of presentations want to do that. So I think for very practical considerations, realistically, we will, I guess, cons continue to share slides in the form of video streams. But again, if the codecs are good enough, then they should not cons uh, just transmit that as a full video stream, but they should only do Delta block updates anyway. And when you switch from one slide to the next, it should really only change uh, the Delta. And it, it's still less efficient if you encode it as a picture, as a pixeled picture, than it would be if you shared the slide sources. But I think that is not actually as bad. So any moving video where a lot changes from slide to sl uh, from uh, picture to picture will be a lot worse from a network transfer perspective than just slides. Uh, you were mentioning that uh, concerning the energy consumption of uh, blockchain usage that they were thrown out from China and then Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. When are they thrown? Brownout from Texas. I don't know. I think Texas hasn't seen brownouts yet. Maybe it needs events where people actually suffer from not having enough electricity left over for any regulation to take place. As long as there's money to be made and people don't suffer too much, um, well, that's cynical of me, but it turned out to be true in China. As long as there was enough money to be made and the problems were not big enough, turning up and uh, firing up a few coal plants that had already been powered down was good business. And so people did it. Only when they started causing big trouble did regulation come in. Amazing. So I look if there are further questions. So there's another. I don't I see. Think, no. right now. I also, I think we, we have uh, captured most as a, all of the questions. Uh, Rene, once more, thank you very much. It was really very, very interesting. Uh, 
As usual, I ask for the slides so that we can put them online, yeah. if it's okay for you. Happily, I will um, send the PDF along tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, all the uh, students and all the participants, uh, thank you for attending. You know, the next uh, lecture is in the new year. Uh, this is then the only lecture which will be hybrid because it's the um, presenter will come to TU Wien. It's the head of the Leibniz um, Computing Center Munich. And, uh, but of course it's also streamed um, for the rest of the world. So I can only, uh, it, it leaves me to say uh, seasonal greetings, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Uh, Renee, thank you again and yeah, see you next time. Happy holidays. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody.